distinguished panel, we have uh, uh, three perspectives from uh, Latin America and uh, from Canada. However, I would say there's one uh, overarching issue, and it is uh, uh, bringing together not only here, but also more globally, and this is the trust. If we see the impact, much less to talk about the impact on trust, trust in public institutions, trust in government, trust in political actors or various actors, central and local level. This is critically important when, for example, in the host country, we experienced uh, unprecedented loss of trust in the past year after the Can you hear the, the interpreters? Okay, so there's still a technical issue. Okay, so just tell us when it's functioning. Can you hear? Is it is it functioning the interpretation now? No, still not sufficient. Is it okay? Can you hear? Is it working now? Yeah? Can, can you hear? Is it? So, so everyone can? Great. So maybe just to, to save time, uh, I'd like to mention very quickly the example of uh, Mexico, but also more recently in Brazil. And uh, I recall that uh, a decade ago in, uh, in Canada, that was after the sponsorship of Scandal, uh, Canada also experienced a, a significant drop. However, we are more here to identify where are the risks, so how the political financing is linked to decision making, what are the risks, in the, and also what are the existing legislative frameworks, institutional implementation uh, measures functioning in order to overcome and uh, support uh, uh, what we call quality decision making or quality, high level quality of the policies. And last but not least, uh, of course, I'd like to mention uh, that uh, in the OECD we have been working with the wider Starting immediately because it is uh, time, we have a great privilege to have uh, the three distinguished speakers. Uh, and uh, first, uh, Jean-Pierre Guinclou, who is uh, the former chief uh, electoral uh, officer and uh, in Election Canada, and <coughs> also he's professor at the Ottawa University. And he used to work uh, actually in the Treasury Board Secretariat, also in charge, for example, conservative issues, policy, etc. He is not only working in Canada, but also 
sharing the insights, experiences, for example, of, with Mexico and for this uh, distinguished uh, contribution we received uh, as a member, as an order of uh, Gordon Aspect Eagle. We, we have after Canada uh, to be two distinguished speakers from Latin America and sharing the Brazilian perspective and we have the privilege of uh, Andrusio Enrique, the technical advisor for the Democratic Labour Party leadership for the Brazilian political reform and the Chamber of Deputies, the lower chamber of the Congress. And we have also uh, Maria Marvan, the president of Fund Assessment in Africana, uh, the most distinguished the civil society organization, which is also the chapter of Transparency International and uh, the Anti Corruption uh, Global Civil Society Organization. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing the, uh, these perspectives. And uh, I'd like to Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Is this working? Thank you to the staff. Buenos dias, señoras y señores. En primer lugar, deseo agradecer a los organizadores por este privilegio. I was advised initially when I was asked to speak that I had 10 minutes to make my presentation. I wrote back and I said, are these 10 Mexican minutes or are these 10 Canadian minutes? I was told I had 10, 15 Canadian minutes was the answer. There was no further interpretation. So I've asked the chair to advise me after 13 minutes, because if we speak more than the time that's allotted to us in Canada, there's a jail term that accompanies us. I was asked to speak about three things. The most effective practice diminish or eliminate the risk of policy capture regulation of third parties, and what is the best mechanism for implementing these measures. What you will be hearing is a perspective from someone who ran the elections in Canada for 17 years. I ran five general elections, one federal referendum. There's 35 million people in Canada. Two thirds of them are electors. I don't consider myself an expert, I just consider myself who did it. Uh, therefore, a doer a thinking doer. And what I wanted to relate was the Canadian approach to these things. You know, whenever we say this, initially people say, well, it's Canada, it's easy over there to do this. It's just as hard as everywhere else. It's just as hard, but I happen to think that we succeeded a lot. And there are reasons for that. Uh, to, to start answering the questions I was asked, by the way, one of the strengths of the Canadian system is the Canadian people. They are fed by the media and they react, positively or negatively. They are involved in their democracy. They know that democracy is two Greek words, the first one being people. Democracy. People is what matters. And they're very alert and they watch politicians like hawks. What, they do. what are some of the moving forces that brought change to Canada? Scandal. People are moved by scandal. Politicians are moved by scandal. When there's a scandal, they react because the people want action. Whether it's a scandal that has you know repercussions legally or not, when something occurs that is not correct, that is major, they react and they want action done. What also helps in terms of what happened on the Elections Act was the Chief Electoral Officer, an Officer of Parliament, writes reports to Parliament about what is working in the system and what should be happening in the system to continue to strive for improvements in the running, the management of elections, implementing the measures concerning crimes, whatever. There's also the opportunity to provide testimony to parliamentarians directly. Chief Electoral Officer appears before parliamentary committees more often than any other Canadian. I did it for 17 years, so I know that. They want to know what's happening to their electoral system. That's the part of the What also is characteristic of, of what we've been able to achieve, and this is not a, a bragging game, this is a reality. 
there was, there's a holistic approach on money in politics. Money in politics is the hardest nut to crack. And until it is cracked, it is not a democracy worthy of the name. Really. If you don't crack this nut, then it is not democracy, it is rich people democracy. And this is what we must avoid if it is going to be short democracy. So what we've done is, under the Parliament of Canada Act, which regulates what parliamentarians can do, we've said what they can do and what they cannot do. And what they can do is, or what they cannot do is highlighted. They cannot vote for any, on any contract where they have an interest. There's also a code that is associated under that Canada Elections Act, or sorry, the Parliament of Canada Act. And that code defines a whole slew of things. What are gifts? What are loans? What is hospitality? Un amigo it's que es un pariente, que es la hospitalidad. There's a commissioner who's appointed by parliament, another Hay officer of parliament. That means you answer to parliament. That means there's no minister involved, there's no politician no involved in this game. You answer político. directly to parliament. Parliament is above everything in Canada. El parlamento está más alto and that person is responsible for implementing Canada. that code, meeting with the members of parliament when they're elected telling them what it is that they're expected to do, what the law requires of them. They have to know these things. That's once they're elected. There's also a law on conflict of interest which applies to ministers. Because ministers involved in decision making. Those ministers must divest themselves of their pecuniary interests. In other words, blind trusts. You can not tell your trustee what to do with the assets that are in there. So all the stuff that you have, roll in there. If you don't want to do that, you're not getting into government. It's as simple as that. Then the commissioner, on all those fronts, publishes everything relating to the public office holder. By the way, some people say, well, you know, that's too late because some people have been corrupted. Well, even though we don't do it in Canada, it would be an opportunity when that person reports on all the assets. If that person, had, if that commissioner had the right to investigate, if something was untold, if a person has $5 million in assets and held a $15,000 a year job, maybe you should try to understand how that $5 million came about by asking Si By the way, what you do is you also make it a crime to lie. It's a crime to lie, eso. and here are the penalties associated with bueno, this. There are penalties associated with every infraction under the code. The severity decides código, exactly what happens. You can be trapped on the eh, fingers, you can be faced with a public opprobrium, or you can go to jail. Censura, si and I will relate an example in the news very closely. The public reports. Después, on what changes are occurring there. The other jobs that you can hold where you can make money, all of that has to be approved by the public office Any office that you hold in a, in a voluntary organization must also be approved because there can be conflicts of interest for you as a decision maker with a non-profit organization. The fact that they don't make money is not the issue. It's, is there a conflict of interest? By the way, on every change, whenever there's a scandal, the politicians, the senior bureaucrats or public servants will try to just treat that scandal. They don't want to broaden it further, even though there may be another problem that they know exists but has not arrived yet. As a, there's, a, there's a reason for this. It's called resistance to change. We've all got it. No one likes to face a change. And when you're an elected official, whenever there's a change to the electoral system, what you're really saying is there's going to be a change on whether I keep my job or not. So I don't think we should blame politicians for resisting change. I think we have to understand what are the forces that should compel them to act. This is what should have to happen. The commissioner can investigate allegations. Canadians can complain. Uh, by the way, what I was saying about what should be happening also are the conflicts of interest. Public, senior public servants, and all public servants in Canada, have a code to which they, they have to adhere. And presentations are made to them when they join the public service, and cyclically, about what their responsibilities are to avoid conflicts of interest. We also have a Lobbyist Registration Act. That is to say, <coughs> 
you're a corporation and you want to make representation to government. If you're an individual, you set yourself up as a hired lobbyist, that's okay as well. <coughs> Just register with the Registrar of Conflicts of Interest, <coughs> who is also an officer of parliament. So politicians cannot intervene. You must report every meeting that you have with a senior public servant, with an elected official, a member of parliament, or with a, a minister. You must report that. This is all made public. Okay, and it's done on a cyclical basis. If you don't report them all, that's a crime. And you know who's checking this out? Average Canadians. And some people who don't like you. Okay, there's people who don't like us for some reason. It always escaped me why they don't like me, but that's beside the point. Someone doesn't like someone. Your opponents are out for you, and they will check that out, and they will complain. And Canadians also do that, and I'll explain that further. <coughs> The, the Lobbyist Registration Act also says that lobbyists cannot participate during elections to help a candidate or a party. This is where the system is saying, people with money, this is your entry into the system. This is your gate. You have privileged access because you have money. We recognize that. We, the elected officials, want to hear what you have to say when we want to change the environmental laws on oil production, whatever, you have your, your track. You've got the money, okay, we'll listen to you, but we'll tell the people exactly what's happening. But during elections, you disappear. You disappear. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In other words, you're already advantaged, this is your gate. That's it. Then we have the Canada Elections Act, the thing with which I'm most familiar. I did the other things as well. By the way, I ran the conflict of interest regime when Brian Mulroney was prime minister for three years. I did all the ministers, how you adhere to the code of conflict of interest. That was fun as well. Money in politics is a topic. The Canada Elections Act. Money is like water. Money is like water. It'll find the tiniest, tiniest crack, and it'll get in there. This is the issue with money. It's like water, okay? It'll find that little crack. And the people who find that little crack inside of two days, maybe it's one, maybe I'm being generous, they will drive a Brinks truck or a Garda truck right through it. That little crack. So I told my people when I was running the system, you don't change the interpretation of the money laws under the Canada Elections Act without my approval. We will have a discussion about what this means. Because they will approach you, politicians, party, political parties, and they will say, well, you know, this is what the regulation says, this is what your interpretation says, but what if the person is left-handed? Does that change? What if the person has only one eye? Uh, does that really change? And then you start to say, well, if it's the left eye, it's okay, and you're, you're cooked, you're finished. That's the crack that they need. They will drive that truck right through. So you've got to hold that system very firmly. What, do we, what, what have we done in Canada? Well, we said, okay, we don't equate money with free speech. We, well, we do in a way. We say that for free, for speech to be free, there has to be limits so that everyone has a chance to speak. Instead of saying everybody can say whatever they want as much as they've got money to do it, we've done the opposite, okay? And I know with whom we're in opposition here, everyone knows, that's not an issue. It's a very different approach. Two neighbors, very two different approaches. Two, okay. We establish reasonable limits on expenditures by candidates and parties. $100,000 per candidate, approximately, 25 million on part of political parties, approximately, depends on how many you see. Limits on contributions, $1,500 per year. Only Canadian citizens can give, no corporation, no union, no association, no NGO, you cannot give. Mandatory reports on the internet, people who are implementing the We reimburse expenditures. There are three sources of public financing in Canada. 
We reimburse the expenditures of parties, 50%, candidates, 60%. Think about that money. We give tax credits for individuals who make contributions. You get about $500 back as a credit on a $1,500 contribution. And there used to be a per vote subsidy. It's gone because this prime minister did not like it because it helped his opponents. So he eliminated that. But that is something that should be considered, a per vote subsidy. In other words, you reward people for their what they've done. We also implement the legislation. We have a commissioner who investigates complaints, also independent, and we have a director of public Sahibizatos from uh, the Venice Commission. Uh, how do you think that countries may dissuade you from rising to politics in such a harsh measure uh, and have no other regulation of uh, the international situation? We will have seven candidates for each seat in the House of Commons. What, what the people want when they run for office is the authority. The opportunity to serve Canadians, some have a personal interest, yes, but we made it clear this is where your personal interest is permitted. But we have no problem attracting candidates, none whatsoever. Okay. Fortunately, uh, thank you again, and uh, manages this disruption, and uh, this shows again the flexibility, but I also learned that uh, uh, we shouldn't lose uh, good scandal. I think Canada shows a very important uh, example. Uh, Brazil recently experienced a major scandal in the Petrobras case. So we would be very eager to learn about the political implications, particularly the leadership, the role of the Congress, and also how you combine it with very, very specific incentives for politicians in order to make it happen, make it So I'm going to skip that. Um, I've already been introduced. I'm a senior civil servant at the Chamber of Deputies that I work at and as a technical advisor for the Democratic Labour Party leadership. And I could not start without saying uh, all the sponsors and the chair and the people and the staff for being here. It's really a pleasure. It's an honor to be here to share my thoughts on what would be 
dejar que esté aquí y me agrada poder compartir mis pensamientos y encontrarme con maneras de tener mejores políticas. Ah, no voy a hablar de los escándalos, voy a hablar de cosas más positivas. Para entender eso, creo que tenemos que pensar en la democracia como un régimen de respuesta y en ese sentido funciona los que votan o no votan y de ahí es que escogen los representantes son los que van a votar y ese es el presidente de las políticas y ellos deciden acerca de las políticas y ese es el virtual ciclo porque esta política pública debería ser un ciclo entonces porque esa tiene que ser la preferencia de los votantes Needless to say that parties are crucial in this process because they are important at labeling and they are important at organizing the process. And, and we also have to understand the context. It's crucial and because this public policy making is anchored in a major legal frame. And our legal frame is the 1988 Constitution. And it was promulgated after 20 years of military regime. So we can't think of parties in Brazil without looking at the context. Because the constitutional rights were really worried about granting a specific status, a very important status to parties as social organizations. And how did they do that? First of all, there is no independent candidacy. So you have to be affiliated to and they are autonomous. There is almost no regulation. There is a chapter in the Constitution that it's very short. That was the intention. And as the minister uh, said yesterday, they became private entities. They used to be like authorities, state arms, much regulated, and nowadays they should have less regulation. That was the principle. And they should have, in order to work properly, they have congressional support, which means leaders, um, rules, and staff like me to help them to produce good public policy. That's what we try to do. <laughs> That's why we're there for. Uh, and of course, there is no freedom without money. We women know that very well. Yeah? So we, they had to, to give public funding and a specific budget allowance, annual budget allowance, voted in Congress. And also, um, so nowadays it's 5% to all registered parties and 95% okay, proportional to the votes cast to representatives elected at the Chamber of Deputies and, oh, oh, it's okay. and airtime, why? Because parties need to uh, tell people why they're there for, what are their ideas, so throughout the year, and judicial oversight. And what happened? This, uh, the national elect, uh, na part, nation, uh, party national elect, uh, sorry, the national party act. Uh, uh, passed in 1995, yeah, and what happened? The budget allowance is always growing, and this year is more than double the last year. The number of congressional parties also, we now have 28 congressional parties, and the number of parties eligible to defund skyrocketed in the last Congress, yeah? You can see that there. We have 32 parties nowadays. So instead of having that chain of responsiveness, the good one, we have this chain of competitiveness. So this is also the contest of our, our election. The votes now, they represent seats, and seats represent funds. Needless to say that we have fierce competition outside Congress to get in there and also in Congress. So it's difficult, to, consensus is even more difficult. It's difficult in a PR system. With this framework, it's even more difficult. It's, we have tough votes, and we also, it's difficult now to pass the good public policy. So that was not what the constitutional right to want. What does it mean that now uh, the, the, spe I mean, the allowance for these years is $232 million, that's $3.5 uh, per dollar. 
figure. And, um, and also, on top of that, we have airtime. In the last year, it was a King Peng year, 2014. There was the tax wave. It's not that the man, they give money, they give you know, tax wave for you know, the time in television. It was 214 million. So people are not very happy with that. Parties and, 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 and Congress are the last institution in the rank of reliable institutions for the sixth year in the world. Also, our lax election cost. 1.42 billion dollars. That's a lot for us, and people are not happy with that. So, move. Okay, and it's growing. You look. The first one is 2010 uh, numbers, and the second one 2014. So it's growing. So we don't know if it's going to stop. And in order to see if uh, public policy can be somehow averted, we have to see who is financing elections. And we see the constitutional writers wanted to have citizens. Our, our first law only allow uh, the bill, not the law, but the bill only allowed uh, citizens to, to, don to donate to campaigns. And nowadays we have corporate financing our, our elections. It's the red one. You can see it from the moment, but it's the red one. The blue one, it's citizen contribution. And public funding is a very little tiny percentage. So it's completely on the other way, I mean, against what the constitutional writers wanted. And also to see if, if uh, it can be averted, yeah, we have to look at the major donor. The minister mentioned that yesterday. Uh, donors are very much concentrated. And these are the, the biggest funders, and some of them you will find in the headlines in some of these scandals. So, this Congress is started as the last Congress with a, a, a need for a political reform. It's always seen as a panacea, which is not. But this time, what they wanted? Limits and limits and limits. I know that limits are important. Of course, they are important. But what people don't see is that we have this framework of autonomy. And to work with limits in, in, auto, in an autonomy, um, congre um, sorry, constitutional framework, it's kind of hard. Why? Because it can uh, produce some uh, judicial claims. And it has been happening. Um, so, our current legal support, and also people forget that we already have, we should have had these limits. Why? Uh, following the constitutional um, principle, uh, we enacted a law in 1997. It was our first election law. And it says that Congress must pass a bill every election year telling, you know, what are the limits. But Congress has never done that. And they've given the prerogative to parties. And parties, of course, are not good at that. Yeah. And we also have limits to donations. They might not be that, you know, we can arrange that, we can put them higher, but still we have them. And it's like setting limits like a hot potato game. Nobody wants to do anything, nobody wants to hold it, you know. So that's why, you know, we, we, uh, then we don't know if we need, uh, uh, you know, like a superhero to help us because we, have, we are in the middle of this, this, uh, this hot potato issue, yeah? But still, there is consensus that compliance and enforcement is, you know, the first word, and that we, no good legislation, we can't draft any good legislation without compliance and enforcement. It won't work. So, what I propose here is to shift to a positive framework. Of course, we need limits, but we should shift from sticks, the limits, to carrots. Why? Congressmen are rational beings. Yeah, yesterday, Ditongo uh, mentioned, it was very important, he mentioned that they make money from politics. We can't forget that. You know, and every time, they will find a crack. They will find a crack. If we only work with limits, it won't work. So what I'm proposing is that we should work on incentives to pass better public policies. I heard that in Canada. They do that from what I gather. So to build a better Congress, you know, a better policy framework, 
That's mejor our Congress, by the way, in the 1960s, yes. Marco, okay, so work on educational measures with affirmative legislation. So, where, for example, we need more women in Congress? Okay, so let's give incentives to parties who really have elected women. Okay. Elected women. We draft a, le uh, a legislation like this, and our member is trying to pass it. It's hard because we are a minority anyway, but I think it's the way. Uh, if we want compliance with the law, to the law, why don't we uh, give incentives to limited corporate donations to make them the not deductible, for example, or give credits? We don't work on that in Brazil. We only work on limits. Um, we want to foster citizen participation. Why don't make you know donations deductible? They used to be in the military regime. That's incredible. So, thank you very much. I would love to hear your thoughts on that, really. And if they are not possible here, that's my email. So you can send them. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. We greatly appreciate and also this, I'm bringing so many interesting ideas and uh, enriching the discussion. So uh, after Mexico, uh, we, we mentioned uh, they are facing uh, some very specific issues. But also, recently in June, the Congress uh, passed uh, significant uh, on simulation tra transparency, tra the national anti-corruption system, European system, etc. So this is my great privilege to be involved and uh, uh, invite Maria as the next speaker, also bringing insight from uh, your previous uh, position as the head the leader of the National Election Institute. So the floor is yours. First of all, I, will, I would like to thank you for the, for, for the invitation. I think it's a very uh, important issue to talk about it. I would like to focus my presentation on, on three things, of, of course, all of them around um, finance, political, in the electoral uh, moment, as well as afterwards. Uh, first of all, the uh, transparency and accountability framework in Mexico which I think is very strong. Uh, second, the law enforcement and uh, the uh, different laws in a uh, prevention of corruption. Especially, I would like to, to focus on disclosure of assets and interest, uh, which is not very strong. It's actually very, very weak. And uh, in the third place, uh, what um, the OCD calls, and I think it's important to, to call it that way, the uh, culture of integrity and the fostering this culture of, in, of integrity. Uh, I must say that uh, Mexico has a very strong uh, um, legal frame, framework, both in controlling uh, the, the public finance no, the finance to, to the political parties, uh, you must have uh, the, the majority of public funding. Actually, you cannot have more than 10% of private funding. Uh, you uh, have um, the public funding uh, in base of two different things. First of all, 30% of the public funding uh, will uh, be uh, shared uh, equally to, the, to all the po political parties, and 70% according to the uh, results in your last elections. That way, you, you try to level the field. Every uh, registered political party will have access to public funding, uh, but uh, there is an incentive, of course, if you did better in the last uh, election. You have to report to the uh, electoral authority every single penny that you uh, spent, which is true is that uh, what the political parties do, they report what they spend and they have a legal proof of the spending, meaning is not in cash. 
eh, it is a problem in, still in Mexico. All the cash that flows in the political campaigns and especially during the election day. And that feeds clientelism. Yeah, and that, that is a fact. Uh, I said that you, uh, we have very important transparent uh, policy in Mexico. Every single donor uh, has to, to be registered. You have a, a very low limit uh, uh, of um, donation that you can have, around one million pesos that must be like uh, 70,000 uh, dollars at the most. Uh, there is no possibility for any, uh, we call it a persona moral, any, any corporation, any uh, sindicato, any, any union, any church, any NGO, only, only physical persons can donate money to the party. Um, and that is registered, and if you uh, ask through FOIA, who has don donated uh, money to any single party, you have access to that list. Not always people ask for that list, but uh, you have the right to ask it. You don't even have to be Mexican to ask for, for this list of uh, people that are donating funding uh, to, to the political party. Uh, we also have, and I think that's one of the problems, uh, the, 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 trans, the, transparent legal the transparency legal framework is also very strong in terms of uh, public offices, uh, the, the government, the, the Congress, the judicial power even, but that does not connect. And I think that's very important. I mean, uh, Electoral authorities work on all the transparency of political parties, on, on all the control in money in political parties, but once you are in office, there is no connection between electoral work and uh, the government work. And I think that's a, a, a very important uh, issue. And let me tell you why. Uh, I said my second point will be uh, about uh, prevention of corruption, talking especially about disclosure of assets and uh, as well as disclosure of interests. As a candidate, you do not have the obligation and the parties do not have, do not have the, the, the internal policy to ask for a disclosure of assets or interests. You just do it once you are elected or once you are in office. And the past doesn't count. And I think that's, that's very important. I mean, uh, almost if we hear our colleague from Canada, I, I know my, my, my affirmation will be a little bit an exaggeration, but almost it's pointless to do it once you are in office. If you didn't di uh, do it once you are candidate, I mean, that has to be a continuum. And it's not in Mexico. And I think that's giving us problems. Uh, about disclosure, in Mexico,